Hello. Uh, let's start our work. Start uh, our workshop. Uh, free software and human rights on the internet. Uh, the initiative of this workshop belongs to the representatives of the academic community of the National Research University Health School of, Econ Health School of Economics, Moscow, Russia, uh, especially law and business informatics department. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am uh, Svetlana Maltseva. I am a Dean of Business Informatics Department of Fire School of, Econo of Economics. Uh, and uh, our session is organized with the uh, participation of uh, Fire School of Economics Local Hub. Uh, let me introduce uh, the co-organizers of this workshop. Uh, First of all, Dr. Andrei Sherbovich, who represents the uh, uh, law department of uh, Higher School of Economics, and uh, uh, Dr. Mikhail Komarov, who represents the business informatics department. And also, let me introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, Dr. Norbert Bolo represents uh, free and open uh, source software moment and uh, uh, he will tell us uh, about uh, freedom HTML and their right to develop. Uh, Dr. Andrei Sherbovich, who uh, represents the law department uh, of uh, Higher School of Economics, uh, uh, will focus on uh, legal and human rights uh, issues uh, caused by distribution of the free software on the Internet. Uh, Roxana Radu, uh, who is represented, uh, who represents uh, Graduate Institute of uh, International and Development Studies, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, the topic of her report is human rights and the uh, community environment, a social justice uh, lens to host. Uh, Dr. Tracy Hawkshaw, Diplo Foundation. Uh, Vice Chair of the Internet Society Trinidad and Tobago Chapter, and uh, he, his uh, report uh, will focus on uh, the potential opportunities, challenges, and implications of open source software for small island developing states. Uh, Dr. Mikhail Komarov, uh, who represents uh, Higher School of Economics uh, Business Informatics Department, will um, tell us about open data approach. And uh, uh, what about Dr. Fuad Bajwa? Uh, unfortunately, maybe he will connect to us uh, through internet in remote mode. Uh, the agenda of our workshop includes the session of uh, reports of panelists and the session of uh, questions and general discussion. Uh, before we start uh, the session of uh, our reports, I want uh, to make uh, a brief introduction uh, to the, our, our session, to, the, to its issues. And uh, I must say that uh, before we start, um, we uh, just have a small discussion about word free and the term free software. Of uh, course, I think it's better to um, say uh, leave software. Uh, but um, uh, we uh, today we will um, speak uh, maybe not about uh, software, uh, uh, free software first of all, but first of all about uh, uh, providing human rights by uh, this. Uh, kind of software. Uh, I must say that uh, design development and use of software is increasing in all uh, countries and all societies and uh, today access uh, to software is uh, largely determining our capabilities for education, communication, work and even social activities. So this includes uh, building social moments, promoting citizenship, and transparent democracy, as well as the general government and health uh, services. Uh, 
software uh, permits all areas of economy and life uh, has transformative effects on all spheres. Uh, discussion uh, on the uh, role of free and uh, proprietary software in terms of uh, society in promoting human rights uh, is carried out from uh, the time when the term free software appears. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, both uh, proprietal and proprietary and free software products have uh, the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but speaking about free software or libre software, often see uh, it is an uh, encompassing concept uh, for a re reliable, sustainable, and dependable information and knowledge society, involving all, st all stakeholders. Uh, in this workshop, we would like to consider different human rights-related uh, issues uh, arising in sphere of uh, free software distribution. Uh, among others, um, the uh, copyright issues, uh, dangers and threats um, such as viruses, spyware, malware, and uh, combating them. Also, ethical and legal issues, uh, questions uh, of um, the regulation and policy making on the national and supranational uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the next question is uh, multilingual software, uh, special um, kinds of software, for example, uh, software for persons with disabilities, uh, for inclusive environment, uh, soft-based uh, accessibility rights. Among uh, more specific issues, uh, we could introduce uh, themes uh, like follows. Uh, first, uh, changing copyright and licensing policies. Uh, second, uh, creating software for free distribution worldwide. Then, software and issue of uh, filtering and blocking policies, and uh, link between software and har hardware regulation. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, let's start the session of reports. Uh, first of all, I want to pass the microphone to Norbert Bolo, and uh, he will tell us about freedom HTML and the right to development. Thank you. By way of introduction, I would start and say a few words about why I care about free software so much, why I have become part of the free software movement. And just to repeat, when I say free software, I do not mean free as in beer, something that you get free of charge, even though that is often the case. It's not always the case. Some free software is actually expensive, and that's quite all right. No problem with that. The key definition of free software is that you get freedom included in whatever the price is, and that is the freedom to use it for any purpose you like, the freedom to make copies, give them away, the freedom to read the source code so that you can learn from it, and the freedom to even change it, to make it do exactly what you want. So that is free software, and why I care about it is because I care about privacy. I know people who live in countries where it's really dangerous to speak your mind, where it's dangerous to communicate even to friends electronically, Freely, and they need to protect the privacy of their communication. That's what motivates me, because this communication needs to be protected. How can you protect it? Well, you can encrypt it. But when you encrypt it, you have to trust the software that you use to encrypt it. And you also have to trust the operating system that the encryption software is running on, because if the operating system has a backdoor, then you've lost before you start. So how do you find software that you can trust? Well, many people used to think, no problem, we just buy Microsoft, we can trust that. It's known by now, very well known, that that is actually a strategy to get software that is guaranteed to be not trustworthy. Um, so the strategy 
the only real strategy that is left is to use software where the source code is freely available and where there's a lot of people reading that source code and checking it for problems. For example, this little thing here, it runs Debian GNU Linux, which I'm choosing not only because it meets my needs for computing, but also because it's a very widely used free software operating system. Lots of people check it for security bugs. So I don't need to trust everyone in this community. I only need to trust that there are a few people who are really carefully checking that stuff. And in a big community of security researchers, some of them will be trustworthy. Not everyone, no problem. It's enough that there are some good ones there. So that's why I love free software. And now let's talk about being able to actually use this free software in an environment where other people use other software. We, and I want to interoperate with them. I want to visit the website that they visit and be able to read the same thing. There needs to be some standard that makes the free software understand the same things that the other software also understands. We need to standardize things for the web so that everybody has freedom to communicate. I use the web because I want to communicate, I want to access information, I want to access culture, all that. And I can only do that if my free software is actually able to access it. That needs standards. One of the big important organizations where such standards are developed is the W3C. And I'm going to quickly address two of the things that are going on in W3C. One of them I strongly dislike and the other I strongly like. The one that I dislike is a standardization process for something called EME. I will not go into the details. It's about standardization, digital restrictions management, or more precisely, an interface to digital restrictions management, which has the idea that some companies, they have this idea of putting millions of dollars into making an expensive film, and then they want to sell that film expensively, and they think, well, our intellectual property is protected by international law, it's protected by national law, so that is important, everyone has to adapt. And the problem with this is, that the modules that will actually decrypt that stuff, they are most likely going to be built into the operating system. And with free software, you do simply don't get that built in. And you'll not be able to access those cultural goods. It will make people choose between either giving up their human right to privacy or giving up their human right to culture. So, participate in cultural life, of which films just happen to be a part, to many people a significant part. And I would say, hey, stop. Don't make us choose between giving up one or the other human rights. This is our human rights. Everything else is less important. Intellectual property it may be protected at the level of international law, but it's not protected the level of human rights law. So that is the part that has to give. That is the part where changes need to happen when simply not everything can be maintained anymore. Something has to break. We must make it break at the right point, at the point where it does not cost us our human rights. Unfortunately, the leadership of W3C has a different idea on this. They are going forward, it, at least it looks like it. They are going forward with this process. And there's this crazy guy sitting here who said, oh, stop, let's write a specification which defines precisely which parts of HTML are proper to use without violating any human rights. Uh, more details about that little project are 
at freedomhtml.org, which is the first half of the title of what I wanted to say. But there's something else, and I'm actually more excited about it because it's something positive. It's about the human right to development, and it fits really well into the theme of this IGF, which is about sustainable development. There's something going on also at W3C. It's not all bad. There's something good there. There's a community group on web payments. What is web payments? It's about using this fundamental idea that we have in the web of this universal addressing system of URIs. Use that as a basis of a payment system. And that is so totally undermining a lot of things. It's undermining actually some business interests, some seriously powerful cartels. But in that area, at least, we have the advantage that there's no international law which says this cartel must exist. There's going to be a lot of regulatory changes at the national level. And again, I say, hey, we must enable people to make payments anywhere, even the, if there's no bank nearby. And this must be an international payment system, not just a national one. I, I would say this is an essential aspect of the right to development, to enable people to make payments. Just what kind of development are we going to have if we're not ma able to make electronic payments? This is a human rights issue. And I'm very, very pleased to see that right here in this room, we have the chairman of the Web Payments Community Group at W3C. Manu, could you, could you please stand up, please? <laughs> this is the guy to talk to if you want to know something about that. And he actually borrowed me something. I would have loved to own this little marvel, but I don't. It's not available yet for general sales. This is a smartphone. It runs a free software operating system, Firefox OS. It's entirely free software. It has this web payment stuff built in. We're not talking about, about the pipe dream here. This marvel, it exists. It works. I mean, I can switch it on. It's not mine, so I'm not really familiar with this. A moment. Oh, I've just switched off again. Sorry. Anyway, this thing works. Uh, the key point here, this is free software. You don't depend on a company somewhere in this faraway country if you need something changed. If you're a developer here in Bali or wherever you live, you can develop apps for this thing if you need a change to the operating system, it's possible to make it. It's possible to write a patch, get it included. It's the same kind of process like the Firefox browser. It, it even comes from the same place, the software. This is free software. It enables local business. It enables freedom of commerce. This is development. If we can have technology, that we can develop and improve locally, where we can build the competence locally. I'm excited of, about this, and I think it's high time we get rid of that gap between being excited about technology and being excited about human rights. This little marvel, it does both. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Norbert, and uh, maybe some questions. Just quickly mentioning, I will have to rush out of this room right after the questions because for some mysterious reason I have to be in two panels at the same time. <laughs> but I will leave a bundle of business cards with Andre. So if somebody wants to discuss with me, uh, just grab hold of me. You can see I'm excited about this stuff. I like to discuss it, right? Uh, thank you very much, Norbert.
we understand uh, that you are around to the discussion, but um, okay, uh, questions uh, to you um, may be uh, done from the main, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, and uh, I want uh, to pass the microphone to uh, Dr. Andrei Sherbovich. Who will, say, uh, who will tell us about legal and human rights issues uh, caused by distribution of free software on the Internet. Thank you. I'll move to the presentation. Let's start with the slideshow. The uh, major issue is uh, the uh, general legal issues which are uh, caused by the arising of the open and free software uh, and its distribution on the internet. Uh, most of uh, researchers, legal researchers, are doing dealing mostly with private law issues in the scope of uh, the case of software and free software. Uh, in case of uh, public law uh, issues uh, and the, the problems with human rights are definitely related to this uh, problem. Uh, was not uh, discussed in the sphere, uh, in, in focus of Russia, maybe uh, uh, this is uh, a kind of a gap, and we will uh, fulfill this gap. So, what is the free software? It's, the, it's, the kind of the, it's not the, the, the kind of free, uh, the free of payment. It's a free uh, and open code software. Some uh, researchers and most of researchers are uh, dealing with this, uh, different, uh, using different terms, uh, free software uh, or open software. But uh, this, uh, of course, is very important freedom to distribute the open code software, to modify it, to do it to the docking conditions and other. And there is the uh, free software movement, which uh, origin, uh, originally in initiated by <coughs> by the riches uh, by Richard Stallman. Uh, and uh, also there is the issue of the free software or program codes and its license. Uh, uh, the uh, most of the uh, licenses were used by the um, free and open software. Was the uh, Creative Commons license? There is not a, uh, a copyright, but something uh, in the middle between uh, absolutely free and uh, copyrighted uh, software. Most of the free software are used by the Creative Commons li uh, under the Creative Commons license, but it creates a lot of legal problems, mainly different by the, by, by the uh, private law dealing with the civil uh, uh, civil law regulations. Uh, because, for example, in Russian Federation, uh, there is absolutely no legal ground for dealing with the Creative Commons license. Uh, but in general, would like to that uh, yes, the Richard Stallman's uh, idea of copyleft, uh, which uh, according to this to its name, uh, was de de dealing on, uh, especially with software absolutely free uh, from any kind of uh, uh, regulation. It is uh, also uh, good dealing with the uh, Russian concept of internet, which absolutely uh, initially think as a kind of a free space. Uh, it also caused uh, some uh, legal problems, especially in uh, Russian legislation, 
uh, not covering uh, kind of defense uh, of the software, not, not in case as a propri proprietary one. Because pr the pro pro proprietary software user uh, is protected by uh, laws. The user of free software is not protected even in case of lo losing memory, losing information you, with, while if you use uh, the free software. In Russia, a uh, user of free software is used on its own risk. And now uh, I'd like to, there, there I explained uh, so, some uh, principles of the free software movement, the kind of distribution, knowledge, access to information, so, social uh, activities, uh, collective authorship and responsibility, transparency of methods, and partnership. Uh, uh, and uh, kind of ethical network which is used by the free and open source software uh, distribution. And now uh, I uh, would like to move to uh, discussion about three levels of uh, regulation of uh, the free software. I uh, usually uh, make division of uh, the all internet governance issues uh, into three levels, supranational, national, and uh, the community level. Uh, in, in case of uh, issue of human rights, uh, while using uh, the free software, we co also could uh, use those three levels. The first level is kind of uh, uh, using uh, of, of free software. It's uh, not uh, by, 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 uh, written in any kind of uh, international covenant, but uh, in general, human rights uh, uh, instruments submitted by the United Nations, uh, we have uh, references for everyone to enjoy the scientific progress, uh, the freedom of press, uh, freedom of information, diffusion of science and culture. Uh, and uh, we have an, uh, now mo moving to new generations of human rights, which are related to the right of development, some uh, r rights of communication, and uh, some educational rights, especially the, the e-learning programs is uh, ma mainly uh, could be outlined to by, by uh, distribution of the free and open source software. Uh, but uh, I'd like to say that, uh, of course, there are no uh, pro appropriate legal instruments uh, on international level which uh, providing, uh, I think, protection of this kind of uh, event like the free software, especially in sphere of uh, uh, protecting human rights. I'd like to say that uh, personally I am a proponent of uh, this kind of international uh, treaty or conventions or maybe kind of a new, de new declaration of uh, digital uh, rights of uh, and citizens, uh, but it's uh, uh, a sphere of near future. I would like to move the nation to the national level as far as we know like to uh, we are facing here to the issue of piracy when we're using proprietary software uh, in the non-developed states uh, we are using uh, uh, mostly uh, pirated software so uh, this is uh, according to the business software alliance 94% uh, of uh, software used in Vietnam is uh, pirated uh, also, uh, I, I refer to uh, article of Simpson Garfinkel. Uh, it's an uh, article uh, quite old, but I don't know exactly the kind, kind of new uh, instruments related to this topic. Uh, for example, in 2001, in Mississippi, 49 uh, is a U U.S. state. 49% uh, of the software was pirated. Uh, According to uh, the situation in Russia, uh, 
we know that we have some governmental programs uh, which pro providing using free software and governmental structures uh, in, uh, uh, for example, in infrastructure of the websites, uh, uh, governmental websites of uh, we websites of the uh, organs of the executive power of Russia. Especially, we have the Russian electronic automated system uh, on electional, uh, for example, it, it means uh, in Russian, uh, like uh, state automated system elections. So according to the prescription of the Central Electoral Commission of the Russian Federation, non-secret parts of uh, uh, this system should be moved uh, to uh, non-proprietary and free uh, software. So this program uh, of uh, development of the free and open so so software and governmental structures uh, of the Russian Federation is developed with uh, in key, in, in, even uh, when we have an absence of the terms of the free and open software in the legislation of the Russian Federation and uh, accordingly no legal defense in the civil code of Russia. Uh, as we face uh, on the national state level have some risks of usage of the uh, free open software uh, first uh, as I've said uh, previously uh, the software uh, free and open source software uh, is not protected uh, by, by the law and uh, our, our users of the free, uh, free and open source software uh, are not protected uh, there is no uh, issues uh, the, of the legal and judicial court protections uh, of the free and source software. Also, uh, according to the court, uh, r Russian judicial practice, uh, uh, there are no references uh, to the free and open source software and judicial court practice. Uh, so uh, this code uh, has no legal values for the merits of the disputes uh, according to the decision of the St. Petersburg uh, City Court. There is no, uh, of course, uh, the, the, those products uh, which uh, made by usage of the free and open source software is not no evidence to the court according to this uh, judicial position. So also there is a problem of the viruses of the malware and a kind of uh, uh, network vandalism, when uh, people are using uh, free and open source software to create uh, dangerous uh, things, uh, this is also possible in case we have no uh, appropriate means in the Russian legislation, uh, which protecting uh, people from uh, this kind of uh, uh, behavior, where uh, especially dangering uh, this kind of software. Uh, for example, we have a kind of uh, people called trolls uh, when uh, they are using trolling uh, for uh, destruction of Wikipedia articles. The Wikipedia pl platform is also a kind of free software. And uh, especially in Russia, very often uh, people are de destructing uh, art articles written in the Russian segment, uh, Russian language segment of the Wikipedia. So, kind of a community uh, level, I would like to uh, ask a question of the potential clash of uh, cultures. Uh, uh, when uh, network communities are facing the, uh, the issue of uh, free and open source software uh, uh, and uh, have it, uh, to raise the issue, could it be uh, used to protect human rights, to monitor human rights protection? I'd like to make uh, uh, an example when uh, we have a program called Ushahidi, which provides a platform to create the human rights reports, uh, an aggregation of information of the human rights, original developed in 2008. Uh, this Ushahidi created a map uh, reporting human rights violence. 
it's uh, one of the issue of free and open source software to protect uh, and uh, human rights. Now it's a kind of a, a platform for monitoring human rights in prison. Uh, so, uh, and I think to, I would like to come to conclusion is that uh, that it uh, should be developed for pr protection of human rights, but uh, we should have an, an appropriate legal base with uh, legal references so that uh, creators, distributors, and users of free and open source software should be prote legally protected. Uh, this is my general position. So uh, even in sphere of absence and uh, not, not, not so developed legal and information culture, uh, usage of uh, this kind of software could be, fa uh, could be a real problem for everyone who are trying to uh, use and free and open source software and live in uh, a kind of legal, uh, appropriate legal environment. So I think uh, uh, there is the finish of my presentation and open for the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Andrei. Uh, maybe some questions uh, from the floor and from our remote participants. No questions? Okay, then uh, maybe a uh, discussion of questions uh, will be after the uh, old session of our report. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Andrzej, because we, uh, you um, tell us not only about uh, problems of human rights, uh, human rights, um, uh, in connection with uh, free software, but also with uh, open data. And uh, I want uh, to continue the uh, issue uh, of human rights. Uh, and uh, you have a question? Question? Hi, my name is uh, Manu Sporni. I'm with the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, and um, uh, we have a number of companies that use uh, Creative Commons licenses. Uh, I was uh, interested in hearing uh, more about uh, why there is an issue with Creative Commons licenses in Russia, uh, specifically. Uh, what part of the legal code makes uh, it, it problematic to use a Creative Commons license in Russia? I could answer in this way. Uh, Russian uh, legislation uh, sh uh, are uh, created to uh, work properly only we have a kind of appropriate definition. Uh, we sh uh, should, in, in legislation, even especially in civil courts, it's a very uh, difficult system uh, to uh, deal with. And uh, this is uh, this uh, kind of license is not uh, re a real facing uh, uh, coverage in the civil code of Russia. It's uh, used to have a copyright protection, but not for other kind of uh, licenses. But uh, there are some legal pro um, uh, projects to amending. Uh, the civil code uh, in the way to protect uh, creative commons and other kinds of licenses, but uh, they are all still on work in Russia. Thank you. Another question? Uh, okay. I'm Nabil Benamar from uh, Morocco, uh, ISOC ambassador. Uh, just remarking that we are using Windows uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, and to promote, uh, I think that to promote uh, uh, open uh, source and free software philosophy, uh, we should try to, to use the daily uh, daily basis something like uh, GNU Linux. Uh, 
and not Linux because it's Linux is based on, on GNU. It comes to my mind that uh, we have uh, we had a discussion between uh, uh, ambassadors about uh, uh, cybersecurity, and uh, some we, we 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 talked about this and we we tried to uh, uh, propose some solutions. Uh, from the end user uh, uh, side, uh, basically, uh, something like using, for example, uh, GNU Linux as an example of, so of operating uh, systems. Uh, it, it's, it has been known that it, it's, it's uh, human uh, from uh, viruses, so I don't need antivirus and following uh, updates of antivirus and um, uh, putting a lot of money to, to get it, to download it. It's not the case with, uh, I think, with Microsoft. I think. So this is the first part of my contribution. Second part is the, the definition of, uh, of, of free. It was good to, uh, to remind that free is not free of, uh, of charge. It's free, it's freedom, it's liberté. It's libre in, in, in French. So you, and, and the opposite is not the commercial software. It's uh, the, the, the the uh, 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 Richard call it in French uh, uh, le logiciel privateur. It it uh, it, uh, it deny your your freedom. This is the definition, the opposite definition of the definition of the opposite uh, open uh, source system, like uh, any kind of uh, uh, commercial commercial one. So. You are not the, the 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 other software, the commercial software doesn't respect your freedom because you are not allowed to share, you are not allowed to modify, you are not allowed to see the 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 the, the code, the source code, etc. That's your question you. or your contribution to our discussion? Yeah. Both. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks. You. Thanks a lot. Uh, you have a question? Yes. Contribution. Maybe a contribution after the whole discussion. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we will follow to discuss uh, human rights in uh, information society. And uh, mm, I uh, ask uh, Roxana Rado to tell us uh, about human rights and community environment, social justice, and so forth. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by discussing two examples. Uh, which are relatively different. So the first one is the pharmaceutical industry, where we have a very high protection of the intellectual property rights. Uh, yet there are also exceptions for medicines or vaccines uh, that are so-called uh, liberated from patents, um, in the sense that they are deemed to be for public utility. And in most of the cases, they would be too expensive for developing countries to use. Uh, with the prices that pharmaceutical companies would apply to them directly. Uh, so in this case, I think there's an interesting comparison we can draw with um, the protection of uh, human rights online through particular features of the software we are using. And maybe we can think of um, um, the elimination of patents for such features that impede redistribution when the affected um, outcome is uh, directly impacting on human rights. Um, and maybe one way to move forward the discussion would be to think of a set of principles by which we can identify um, that part of the software or that part of um, patterns that should not be applied to, um, to features which in the future might um, affect um, human rights or might just impede uh, that o only if uh, we think in terms of time that's also important because just reinventing the wheel each time doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, and of course we have to think of uh, interoperability and um, standardization for particular features so this would be the first example my second example relates to mocks the massive um, open online courses which have uh, become very, very popular all around the world. Um, and these are developed currently on platforms that are uh, functioning both open source and under proprietary um, uh, rights. Um, 
um, they are supposed to enhance access to education, especially in developing countries. And the model usually works by having um, well-known universities providing um, courses uh, with open access to everyone. And usually they have up to 2,000 students in courses like this one. And of course, it's interactive material, videos, um, um, some sort of uh, assessment system that is still debated. Uh, but just um, in terms of the choice that uh, the citizen has, uh, and we can think of this model as being a model that in the future will become even more popular because uh, e-learning is already um, increasing its presence, uh, also in traditional universities. So if you think of this and the, um, the choice that the student has, uh, it's relatively limited. You are actually locked in in a particular configuration based on the platform that the university has chosen to has chosen to to use. Uh, and of course, the the quality of the education you might get varies massively. Um, applying some sort of social lens to to aspects of the cyber environment, I think, is necessary at this point. Um, also to to stimulate the kind of thinking that would uh, increase public policy um, influence on this. Um, and I think there is no common uh, understanding of human rights as being universal all across uh, the globe. But we can all kind of agree on, on some set of um, principles. And uh, in this case, I will just um, draw on one of, report, one of the reports that the Internet Society released on human rights and internet protocols. And here there is a very useful classification of uh, how to think about uh, human rights principles. And that includes um, universal uh, equality and non-discrimination, so human rights belonging to everyone, everywhere, roles and responsibilities, the kind of division that, um, in which the states have uh, duties uh, to respect, protect, and promote human rights, participation, voluntary adoption of uh, new standards, stakeholders uh, might have other limited roles. Um, accountability and monitoring, uh, freedom, and in this category we can have a lot of uh, divisions, freedoms to develop, freedom of expression, free flow of information, uh, freedom of association, and uh, last but not least, fairness and rule of law. So if we start from, from these principles, and we look at um, the way in which um, the protocols and standards are developed for human rights and separately for the internet, uh, we realize we have very different fora in which we are playing out uh, this element. So on the one hand, we have the UN system at the global level trying to handle the um, uh, human rights protection. And on the other hand, for internet and uh, internet standards, we have uh, primarily the, the so-called organically developed institutions. Um, the technical community uh, working um, for uh, developing such standards uh, that include the um, human rights um, approaches or not necessarily. And here it's interesting to look at uh, how little um, the interaction between these two fora is, uh, how, how small the interaction is between these two fora. So uh, the UN does not participate directly in um, fast movements or in um, setting some sort of uh, principles that could be used. And at the same time, the technical community is never consulted in the case of uh, treaties negotiated um, uh, within the UN. Um, of course, we have bodies that try to breach the two by inviting uh, experts or opening access to all experts. So IETF is uh, one of those. Um, but this this is still uh, not some sort of integrated approach that um, would actually allow permanent inter interaction. So if this happens um, from time to time, it's good. We are happy to have it. Uh, however, we are not uh, debating who should be involved all the time, at what level, and how exactly we can, we can think of the internet in the framework of uh, the UN by approaching um, open standards as such. Um, the third point I'd like to make uh, regards the role of the state in protecting human rights. Uh, and this has been the case historically. However, with the online environment, we have um, a relatively big change as um, we have uh, the rights right now, the 
the right framework right now, not only under the oversight of the state, but also under the oversight of the public sector and also of the technical um, uh, of the private sector, sorry, and also of the technical community. So um, we need actually to, to move this discussion beyond um, just having the state protecting human rights. Uh, and we need to think of frameworks in which uh, private companies tackle human rights in a, in a way that is uh, meaningful for all of us. Uh, and the way in which this could uh, help in empowering uh, local communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxana. Uh, some questions to Roxana, but only questions. Uh, Hi, this is, um, I'm going to, uh, Manu Sworny, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, chair of the Web Payments Group at the W3C. Um, we currently don't have anybody involved in the work that is looking at the human rights aspect of this. Um, we would love to get somebody involved. Uh, who should we, uh, what, what organization, who should we uh, go to? Is there anyone in specific that you can think of that could help us with the web payments work? Because this really has to do with the freedom to develop, right? Um, so where can we find someone to, to work with on this? for acknowledging that there is um, so much interaction with uh, the human rights community. Um, I cannot think of a name right now, but I'm sure the best approach would be to involve uh, as many different organizations as possible, also because in the um, uh, human rights advocacy community there, is, uh, mm, there are multiple voices speaking for multiple concerns. So maybe we can just talk after the session and think about some of these. Another question? Maybe a question from remote participants, no? They are not active. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Roxana. Um, you started a very, um, I think, important uh, part of our discussion, uh, uh, potential opportunities of um, uh, open source software. And um, I want uh, to continue this uh, issue and um, I ask uh, Dr. Tracy Hawkshaw uh, to make his, his report uh, the potential opportunities, challenges and implications of open source software for small island development. All right, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. So I'm going to take a little different spin um, to the discussion. Uh, focus on the human rights aspect, but not necessarily at the uh, level in which um, Roxana may have drifted into, but talking about uh, a contextual approach to countries that, that, that I come from, the small island states. Um, for those who don't know, just briefly explain. So who are these um, small islands? So there are about 52 of them. And on, on the board there, you see that there are several that are UN um, members and, and about 14 that are not. Um, as a matter of fact, in the Indonesia uh, spectrum, there are, I think there are 17,000 islands in the Indonesia uh, nation. Some of those islands are, in fact, small islands, although Indonesia itself, as a, as a state, is not considered a small island developing state. So the list that I, that I have here Although it is nation states that are small island developing states, the issues that we talk about for internet issues and broadband and so on are, affect small islands within states as well. But I'll, for this particular presentation, only on the small island developing states that are listed here. So in case you didn't realize, they do form a large part of the world. 63.2 million people live in small island developing states. There's a GDP of $575 billion and growing. There are 1.3% population growth. But critically, there are some issues that, as I'll explain shortly, um, that affect these states, especially with the climate change, environmental challenges. Um, in some cases, you see here, 5.4% of the land area is basically below sea level, in effect. 
and about 10% of the populations of these states, so about six, six to seven million people live below sea level, and um, that has implications. There, um, I don't want to go through all the stats there, but there, there are really a lot of interesting challenges that they face. And um, to show you where they are, and just have a, an upside down vision of the world, uh, according to the world map, you see they actually sit generally at the bottom of what the world map normally looks like uh, to a large extent. Uh, they're located in large bodies of water that uh, we, we generally fly across, and we don't realize we fly across these bodies of water. Um, and there are little, these little dots that sit uh, primarily in the Pacific, Indian, Atlantic Oceans, and so on. And um, I come from one, the one that circles around Tobago, and uh, there are many of them in the Pacific region in particular, and some of them actually here in the conference. It's very difficult for us to get to these places, to get to Indonesia, to get to travel, and to, to share these views with you. So I'm hoping that um, you understand where we're going to come from. There are significant issues and challenges facing our country that are still based around issues that may have affected other countries and that they've gotten out of it. We are very much extraction or plantation-based economy. That means we draw our um, exports basically from the earth, whether it be anything from agricultural resources, mineral resources, still doing mining, they're, they're primary industries. There's a continuing dependency on the um, developed world, if you want to use that word, which has implications for this the open source issue. And a lot of economic challenges face these states. Gradual removal of market protectionism, uh, as I said before, environmental challenges, resulting social and economic problems that we face that relate nothing to open source software, obviously, crime and deviance issues, infrastructural issues, and ec social equity, poverty, and a lot of dependence on state welfare strategies, none of which are, you might think, are uh, open source issues, but I'll, I'll explain what I'm trying to get at before. So basically, in the small developing states, before 2003, which is when the whole internet governance versus process pretty much started, uh, we, we would see weakened monopolistic telecoms infrastructure. The ICT industrial development in those countries basically thinned to non-existent. Government underutilization of ICT and a lack of state-sponsored ICT initiatives. And what, we, we, what I call a digital canyon, what we call digital divide. And today, um, to present, We've had some changes, in particular on the liberalization of our telecom sectors, which happened in the, many of those states around the same time, at the mid 2000s, thereabouts, which began opening up the market, began looking at new issues that could have affected these states. And in particular, the, the rise of mobile broadband, mobile wireless um, communication. So, in many of these small and developing states, wired communication is very difficult to, to deal with. So it's primarily through wireless communication. And that leads to a mobile question. Most of the software issues that are emerging in these small and developing states are going to be mobile type software development applications. And again, that has implications for open source and the human rights issue. The private sector um, industry investments have, have started to emerge. Implications are coming as well. A lot of P3 partnerships, well, public-private partners are emerging. We've had increased government utilization of internet and ICT. We've had grant funding emerging. We've had regional and national XPs emerging. We've had recognition of .ttcl, well, CCTLDs, putting our own .tt as a new interest. And particularly, the emergence of rapid take-up of social media, cloud technology, and Web 2.0 technology. Of course, as in other countries, the emergence of digital natives and youth internet activism. So what does that mean for, and I'm glad that my colleague um, Nabil brought up the issue about Libre, because I'm treating with the, the whole FLOSS issue, so free, Libre, and open source floss. In the small developing states, we have this extreme domination in the sector of what we call the box retail um, cost providers. So, and that is not just simply in terms of usage. It's, it's in terms of what they do. They are seen as multinational corporations. 
So just as you might see a large energy corporation or a large mining corporation in, other con in, in countries, these, I won't name the, the, the companies, but they are large multinational type organizations in the small island states. What does that mean? That means they do significant investment in the country. That means they do corporate social responsibility investments as well. So you tend to find that these large companies might be investing in anything from bas basketball courts to crime in um, center initiatives to initiatives related to the universities, their sponsor academic centers, centers of excellence, and so on. In addition to that, we have significant, the weak, significantly weak take up of mobile application development. And when it's done, it's done usually with the sponsorship of these um, large organizations. And I won't again, I won't name them, but you'll see the mobile application take up moving towards these um, larger organizations. And linked to all the things I just said, there's a general ambivalence within the, our tertiary education sector, our academic institution, to software that is not based on the proprietary nature. So open source software, free software, library software is not necessarily something that would be taught or, can, or encouraged in our local schools at the secondary level or the tertiary level. And if you think about it for a second, that means that when someone comes out of a school to develop, the first thing they're going to see is not anything open. They've learned only proprietary technology, and they intend to develop on that platform. And in my own job, I've, I've seen that personally, that even where we are encouraging open source development in the job, the students can't develop. They, 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 they're not able to, to work with the platform. They only know a certain um, level of development, a certain level of a certain language. And to unlearn what they've learned is very difficult at that stage. And as I pointed out before, they're basically more pressing issues to deal with in our country. So, so fighting the, the multinationals in this area, when we have this is a power, water, crime, and so on. I mean, why bother push open source software when we have all of these things happening? These people are willing to come and help fund some of our um, initiatives. So why do we bother with open source software? So there are significant opportunities that I think that we have and we need to take advantage of. And I'd like to have that discussion as well today, in addition to the human rights perspective, because human rights means more than simply freedom to be online and privacy and so on. So in terms of the, the problems that are faced in the small and developing states, I think that open source software, free software, Libre software, provides development for local contextual solutions to local problems. Today, you're not going to find the commercial off the shelf proprietary software solving a water problem, a transport problem, a crime problem in, a, in, a, in our countries. However, using local talent and open technology, we may be able to solve those problems on our own without having the help of others. I think it's a useful and, and very important dimension from the human rights perspective to look at that local solutions to local problems, and we can use this environment to deal with that. Um, FLOSS also allows our, our people to actively participate as developers. And that um, speaks to what we, we spoke about a little earlier. So in terms of actively participating in the development process, the whole life cycle from, from the, the initial code straight to the end state, or so the end product and the commercialization, if necessary, of that product, that platform we leave allows our local developers to actively participate, which, as we see today, it doesn't happen. So there's a, a sort of a bit of a a, a didact, well, a, a strictly consumption approach to software today in small developing states as opposed to um, upload or, or, or creating, creating culture. In terms of uh, things like IP and, and so on, we believe that this platform can allow the reduction of what we're calling um, blacklisting. So in many of the small developing states, and, and it came up in one of the presentations earlier, there's a huge percentage of piracy 
in small developing states and developing countries as a whole. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, my, my country is ranked 81st in the world for IP protection. Jamaica is ranked 79, Mauritius 54, and so on. So in terms of IP protection and copyright laws, we are not very good at doing that. And as, as was Rupert mentioned earlier in the panel, some sort of um, movement towards that environment, understanding of it from both from the Creative Commons copyleft type perspective into the normal perspectives need to happen so that we understand that on the one hand we have protected software, proprietary software, on the other hand we can do software on our own that can be licensed in a different way. We believe that open source software as well can, effective, can, enable, can enable effective knowledge transfer without legal or political restriction. And that's a very important point for many of the states in the region. And we also believe it can close the digital divide. It can, it can foster learning best practices in programming, not just the fact that you're building on those platforms, but the practices you learn in building on those uh, platforms. And it complements our formal education system in terms of teamwork, teamwork, project management, and so on. Again, another issue that may not be immediately apparent in the open source world. Building open source software using community approaches do in fact build teamwork. It builds a certain level of of understanding of how to work together and collaborate that is missing in many of the aspects of, of, of our environment. And in particular, it can create new employment opportunities, new jobs, and especially in our state, entrepreneurship opportunities. We don't have many of that because, as I said before, our industry is very limited. Our industry is based around a VAR, bad approach. So our local software industry tends to sell, resell software from the multinational. But this approach, if it's built and, and implemented correctly, we can build an indigenous software industry, not just building software on existing platforms that are proprietary, but using creative methods to build tools on the open platform and build communities of practice with our own country. So that's my, my contribution. So I'd be happy to hear questions or Hey, any thoughts as how this can work um, in small and developing states? Thank you. Some questions? Um, please, your question. Oh, no, no. <laughs> First question was from. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, um, my name is Nasser Kitani. I'm the uh, chief, chief, chief technology officer for Microsoft in Middle East and Africa. A um, uh, few comments about what you said, and, and, and sort of, uh, but as an introduction, I want to make just to, to look into how the, the industry has moved and how software uh, has moved in the last, you know, just five years. Uh, and, and one of the examples I would like to take, two, two trends, two ma major trends I have seen and we can agree on them, is one is the idea today that software is everywhere. It's in the cars, aircrafts, nuclear plants, PCs, mobile phones, healthcare devices, everywhere. I think we can agree to that and we, we're talking about the Internet of Things, etc. and we see, the, you know, software the, the, the fuel of the economy on all fronts, everywhere, and, and many people are actually developing software. So that's number one. And that's a big change. That's really a major trend in the industry. And, and I, uh, the, the second interesting trend I see is the, is the you know, the, the sort of mobile um, and mobility, whether it's tablet, you know, mobile phones, etc where, uh, just to pick an example, uh, Steve Cook recently, um, uh, the CEO of Apple, announced that there is a million applications on the App Store, Apple App Store. Fascinating, one million. That one million means probably, what, 700,000, you know, uh, companies perhaps out there that have developed those applications and uh, perhaps Many of those are individual developers that have contributed, 
you know, and, and innovate it, etc. Uh, and they if you innovate it on an, on sort of a closed platform, right? Because there is no Apple does not provide the source code of their their application. But the reality is um, there was a lot of innovation based on the platform that Apple was providing. And I can use that for Android, I can use that for the phone, your Windows, etc. But that's just your opinion. So my, my, the point I'm trying to make is that the industry has evolved and, and software um, distribution has evolved and the way you use software today has evolved. I mean, you were mentioning um, and, and think about this, the typical things that you do every day. Um, you search using Google search. You don't have the source code of Google search. You tweet. You don't have the source code of Twitter. You go to Facebook. You don't have the source code of Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just the operating system that you're using. There are a lot of software that you use that is delivered differently, whether it's as a cloud service, a different thing. And, and one, one question, and, and there are very core services that I, use, that I talked about to you. You, you use G, search, Google. I mean, think about it. If you don't have Google every day, search. Uh, <laughs> how your life would be you know, different, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, your email system, et cetera. So there are core services that you use every day for which you don't have source code. And for, in fact, you cannot have it because there's no point in, in having it to innovate. You can innovate without having the source code of that, right? So there's, there is a different form of innovation because, um, and, and I showed that by, by using the app, the, the sort of the, the example of the app store, et cetera, where innovation comes from. So, so the point, so that's the kind of it kind of set of introduction I wanted to make here because because th there is the, there is the right human rights which I I'm very you know activist upon and there is the right for innovation as well and uh, and what we have seen uh, recently is that innovation is also coming from people who do not want to share their source code so the the, the point I was though the question for you then uh, uh, and and one comment I I don't see any reason why open source should not be taught at universities. In, in fact, I, I am an activist on, on saying we should teach open source in universities. We should. There's no point in not doing that. I was a student myself. I learned Unix and Linux and C++ and C, and I had the source code for that. So I'm, I'm a very fan for that, and we should teach that in universities, et cetera, as we should teach other things, right? It's not, it should not be exclusive one or the other. We should do that. But my question for you is why in your country, uh, you need to have the source code of an operating system in order to innovate. I don't get it. You, if, you know, the, the world has moved into application development, and you can innovate on top of existing platforms. You don't need to have an open source of something to innovate, the, the source code of the, something to innovate. The reality is you can innovate by adding to what's existing without having the source code and changing it. I, I don't see why do you need to have that. That's something wrong with me. I mean, in the UK, there are, just in the UK example, there are 200,000 developers, 200,000 development, 200, developers doing Facebook applications, adding to Facebook, 200,000. Can you just imagine? Very, very in, on one thing, they don't have the source code for Facebook. They have APIs. So I would respond by saying, first, I didn't say, I didn't say that. Right, that, that'll correct you. And secondly, huh? no, I, don't, I never said I need, need the source code to develop. I, never, I don't have that source code anywhere in my site. I don't have the word source code anywhere, actually. I can go back to it and show you. What I, was, what, I was, what I was saying is that the way that in these countries that the multinational type organizations operate, Right? Is that to, answer, to respond to your first point about open source being taught in school? Is that it is not encouraged that open source is being taught in school? Right? So I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Right? And, and that's, uh, I mean, I, I live there, so I'm, I'm explaining that to you. Secondly, in terms of having the source code to develop or not having the source code to develop, that's not the issue. The issue I was making is in terms of developing local contextual solutions to local problems it would be diffi more difficult, and it has been proving to be more difficult, and I have experience with this, to build solutions using proprietary software than with open source software that's uh, contextual to the environment. I'll, I'll explain to you what, what I mean by that. 
when you're building something on, let's say, a database that is proprietary, the rules of that proprietary database that don't allow you to do certain things, or the cost, of the, uh, let, let's get to that discussion, of using a particular database, database solution, to build a solution that might scale to something that a government may want to use. Right? So let's assume I'm, I am I need a transportation solution. Right? And that transportation solution requires some level of scaling, resilience, and so on. In the proprietary world, that solution is quite costly on many levels. In terms of acquiring the solution, of accessing the support for that solution is very important. Support and what? Okay. So we're, now we're talking, we're not talking about free in the search of Libre. We're talking about free in terms of free dollars. And, 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 and there is a very fundamental right, confusion and, and, here. And I, I just and I, and I started my present and I showed you, I'm, I'm dealing with FLOSS, the whole thing. And I, and I expl actually have explained that at the start that I'm not here to talk about the, the, the dilemma of free, libre, I'm all, the whole thing. So I'm, particular, I'm referring to that in particular. So I'm speaking to that issue. And if that's issue we're speaking to, then we have a different discussion. Yeah? Uh, okay, uh, my name is Aman. I'm from Indonesia. I've been using uh, for open source for around 10 years. So what I see in Indonesia right now, it's, you know, the government is don't like for uh, open source because it's not making some tax for them, I think. And when I ask to you that when I go to uh, some province in Indonesia that uh, when I tell about uh, Linux or maybe uh, FreeBSD, something like that, they see that uh, Linux is a difficult thing, you know. More like for a server or, yeah, just for server, it's not for uh, using job for every day. Uh, what I want to ask is uh, how to educate people uh, in a country that has so many islands like Indonesia because it's quite difficult uh, based on what they thought that uh, uh, if you, you're using Linux it's very difficult to use it and and the government also doesn't interesting to to you know to educate them and in uh, Academic institution is uh, Indonesia is more like to cooperate with a company that uh, selling property uh, property software uh, because it makes more of them uh, have a, a selling power something like that. So I want to know uh, maybe based on his experience uh, uh, how to educate our people in Indonesia, especially to know about. Uh, Free open source software. Thing like that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for the question. So that's, a, that's an extremely good question. Um, in, in island nations, well, Indonesia is a big one, but you do have small islands, as I would suggest. Uh, the, the way, and I'm going to suggest something reasonably um, maybe creative in that sense. What we're trying to do in our country is have the government itself use open source software in the mobile, moving to the mobile world. So what you tend to find in government is that you have a process where a need is identified. So I have a particular solution. I want to build a tax system or whatever, whatever that solution is. You uh, do a requirements document and you put out a tender and that process might take two years to close and so on. And generally speaking, because of all the requirements of, of, you know, tax certificates and so on, a vendor would win who would use a, a non-open source solution, right? However, there are certain types of solutions that may not be of that nature, maybe very small point solution that may be mobile friendly. And what we're saying is that from the university level, right, or from even from the pre or the vocational school level, why shouldn't the government can, in fact, open up that sphere of application development and, and, and procurement to those institutions using the, the school, the school system, 
to going to the school system and saying, I'm looking to build, as an example, a tax calculator, not a tax system. I want to do that using a mobile uh, interface. Can you, School X, do that for me? What you'll tend to find happening is that the schools themselves will, by every government reaches out, provide a demand for those schools to provide that service to them. You'll find the learning and the, in, the sensitization happening naturally. So you'll find a situation where the school and the uh, universities themselves, in addition to teaching the, the traditional software, will also open a, a door for that other software to be taught and expose their students to it. So that, that group of students who are coming up can learn both fields and can build applications that are on demand that the government may, may require. Because you find that governments in particular tend to, to, to draw demand more than the private sector for these types of solutions. They have a lot of uh, um, ability to sway. They, they spend the most money in most countries. They spend, they're the bigger, bigger spenders. And they will generate the training that you're looking for in sensitization. So it's in terms of, I, I don't want to suggest, you know, you go out and you preach and evangelize open source software. And those, those things don't really work that well. But you need a, like an, almost like a champion, an anchor tenant almost, so the government in this case, to, to, to buy into the process and to go to the schools. How do you sell a government on it? That's a very, another very good question. So another thing you can do is use your local um, societies, your computer societies, your ISOC society, if there's an ISOC in Indonesia, and help the government understand that open source is not what they think it is. It's not this rogue um, type of technology that has no support. Um, it's free, so it's useless. Because most people don't, if, if you don't attach a price to something, it's considered to be useless. And that's some of the problems that open source software faces. Because much of it is, in fact, free. There's no cost. So once you don't have a cost to something, a lot of large organizations and um, governments don't attach value to that environment. So you just encourage the government that it's not like that and to open a door for um, the schools to, to, to teach it using that approach, I would suggest. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, we have small time. Okay. I'm sorry, okay. but... Hi. Um, Manus Forney, World Wide Web Consortium. Short please, short question then. Uh, sure. Uh, one, one quick comment and one quick question. The reason we need access to the source code, responding to the gentleman from Microsoft, is to build devices like this, something that can be um, deployed in some place like Indonesia and, and have the local population build solutions into the core of the device and on top. Yes, you do. Please do not shake your head. It, you, you, you need to be able to do that. There's, there's proof in this. We tried to approach Microsoft to create a new payments mechanism. You weren't, you weren't very responsive to us. Mozilla was because the source was open. We could go directly in there and make changes ourselves. That's, that's, why, you need, uh, that's why you need access to the source code. And I'll ask my question after uh, the thing's over. Your colleagues, leave the questions to Can the I? panelists. Yeah. Okay. Just, just to raise, uh, once again, the, the point of, of treaty. The, 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 this is the, the, the best uh, and the good, the good, uh, the good point. There is, there is no lobby behind uh, open source system. So who can encourage and who can uh, push uh, uh, governments and ministers to, to use on a daily basis some software, some open source software? It's not the case with open source, and it's the case with Microsoft with, with this privateur uh, software. So for example, as a simple example, we can in, for example, with uh, in literature and human science universities, why we are teaching uh, uh, office and not open office, for example. It, so this is not the operating system. This is just an office-based application. So Microsoft um, makes many uh, cooperation and conventions with many governments to push them using on daily basis office. And Please in this case, question. you are uh, paying double license. license. Operating system which is the uh, Windows and Open and Office. It does make sense. What is your question? Does it make sense? <laughs> Microphone. Uh, 
it's uh, new Thank method you. to uh, combination of uh, impact or discussion and uh, question. <laughs> I'm Prakash uh, from Malaysia. Uh, just to add another point, uh, currently we are talking about uh, software, hardware. I think in, in this digital era and cheap technology, we should not rely on any big corporation or big companies to develop and to come up with uh, usable hardware and software solutions. And of course, there's a difficulty in promoting free and open source software. It's not cool, some say. We have to start uh, using it, promote peer-to-peer, -peer, community develop publicity materials, and uh, encourage. Uh, past four years ago, in our organization, I'm from a human rights organization, we implement full uh, Linux-based system to run our office and uh, without any uh, just the hardware cost you have to buy the PC. So, um, and also there's a lot of talks, uh, like even like in Tactical Tech and other alternative groups to build alternative social media. There's alternative for Twitter, Facebook, because it's not popular and no one is using it. And, but of course, the info activists and uh, tech activists promoting alternative solution, you, you can hack on it, it's open, you can develop based on uh, the source code available. Thank you. Uh, it was the question to come on. Uh, maybe we can we can uh, give the word to um, our remote participant remote uh, question the question from remote participant Yes, this is question from XSE Moscow from the audience con concerning Creative Commons licensing. Okay, the question is why Creative Commons does work in Russia? Uh, uh, I mentioned Creative Commons uh, licenses. Uh, and uh, the issue why it's not working properly in Russia. It should uh, when the legal instrument. So the license is the kind of a legal instrument. Uh, when the legal instrument uh, to work properly, it should have some requirements like uh, definition, a kind of uh, well, means of legal protection, for example, access to courts, uh, different legislation. We are not uh, a kind of uh, a, a case law. We are a, a, a continental legal system which requires a proper uh, legal uh, prescription of these procedures of uh, protection of this or that, uh, especially uh, in the sphere of licensing. We have no this kind of uh, proper legislation which could protect uh, Creative Commons licensing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our time failed, but uh, maybe some comments from, uh, from the floor. Hello, uh, I'm Flavio Lenz from the Ministry of Communications in Brazil. And uh, probably as you all know, uh, Brazil has been uh, monitored by uh, an allied country, uh, which is the US. And, and it has been done uh, in the government level, in the citizens level, in companies level. Uh, so wh what I want to say is that I see that the only solution for the world uh, for not risking to have things monitored. And, and this is uh, an issue related to the sovereignty of the countries, uh, is for open uh, solutions. I, I'm talking about software. I'm talking about hardware as well. I cannot depend on the trust 
that I give to the provider of some solution that he's not uh, having some backdoor or some, some bug on my mobile phone or whatever, right? So the only way that I can uh, guarantee that I'm not being spied but any, by, by anyone, and that includes all countries, that includes all technology providers, is that I have a way to make an audit on the solution I'm using. And the only way to do that is if, if I have an open solution. So I, I, I don't feel uh, that uh, either the, the, the free software has a future because the, the, the incentive to innovation is very low if you don't have a paid solution. But I see that the open solution are the real thing that we need search for. Not a free one. It can be paid, but it must be open. And the government can play uh, a real role on this by using its procurement power to buy open solutions. And I'm sure that Microsoft will soon open its solutions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe some comment. comments still. Uh, okay. uh, another question, comment. Uh, okay. A couple of comments, very short. Uh, uh, I don't want to, to give the impression that uh, Microsoft is against open source, etc. It's, it's an absolute uh, wrong statement for people who think that Microsoft is against open source. Um, to, just to make clear that we are, Microsoft, and we can prove that, is the single most contributor to open source today in the industry. We, we contribute millions of lines of code every year to the open source community, so that's number one. Uh, and, and the other thing is we, from, from as, as we are a company and a corporation, the way we look into our business is that we're not competing with the open source idea or concept, we're competing with products. So in the database business, for example, because you took the database example, we compete with Oracle, we compete with MySQL, and we compete with, you know, DB2 from IBM, etc. cetera. Uh, at, in, the, in the case of, uh, you know, Office, we compete with OpenOffice, we can compete with Google Apps, Etc. It's not against the open source idea, but we compete against products and companies, and we need to keep that in mind. Uh, but we contribute to open source, and we like open source, and we pay for open source, and we do open source ourselves. So there's no, and we work with the open source communities. On, on your on your point, I think there are ways for for you to audit non non open source, uh, uh, you know, uh, things because there is no way you can audit the whole system. I mean, think about um, the full chain from the network to the hardware to the routers to the, to the satellites to everything that you need to audit is just, I don't think you can. But from our side, we, from our side, we can give you the source code of Windows to audit it. We just don't give you the open source, the, the source code to, to do something else with it. But for audit, we are ready to give you the open source, to the source code of Windows on, on our product to do so. Uh, thank you very much for all the participants. And uh, we have uh, some comments from our panelists. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we are out of time. So I, I, I don't want to, to make any presentations. I just wanted to emphasize that, um, as it was uh, told uh, by the, one of the panelists, uh, we are talking about public and private partnerships. And uh, that's the main, actually, uh, feature, that's the main trend, that's the main uh, solution for, for the future development. And uh, I, I guess a good example of uh, public-private uh, partnership, uh, it's an uh, open data program, uh, open governmental data program, and actually open data itself. And, uh, you know, uh, we are run out of time, but there, there are some interesting statistics you know, some descriptions, you probably all, all know about it, about the UN uh, initiative on uh, open government data. Even in the United States, they've got like more than 90,000 data sets already released uh, on the website there. 
And uh, why I put it there, you know, with the cell phones, with, with all of these things, because we are talking about mobile era, we are talking about apps, um, you know, we are talking about apps we are using, right? And they're actually uh, another, you know, that, uh, slide showing uh, how apps using our data also there. And uh, we are not talking about payable uh, software, actually, we are talking about free software, yeah, but it's not probably open source software. That's, that's, that's the tricky thing, right? But um, in terms of, you know, in terms of era, in terms of uh, data, because uh, we are talking about, you know, mobile devices, so there are a lot of data generated and actually data collected. You know, in terms of government, so we've got the top on government data. In terms of uh, principles, you also can see here, I, I'm run out of time, so I can't comment it, so you can find it actually on the website, the internet, right? But the thing is that uh, this uh, picture shows uh, which data is still not open. And uh, when we are talking about violations of private, you know, privacy, we are talking about violations of our personal data. Probably we should think about some universal, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms of, uh, of keeping, you know, some, uh, let's say, open private data. Uh, probably anonymized, right? But uh, the thing is that if, if we can prevent a violation of, of that data, so another way to think about uh, trying to control uh, distribution of the data. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we are talking about uh, open open data environment, and uh, where government uh, spread you know the data sets with with all the data to the companies to increase that uh, level of competitiveness, right, and uh, to uh, to uh, help companies. Uh, let's say provide a more efficient service but actually when we're talking about data we're talking about era of mobile devices and the internet of things internet of services and it's a big question you know what is private now when we have sensors around us and some you know companies are using sensors data to create some new services uh, let's say not, not just forecasting but you know traffic analysis and whatever and if it's you know it's not our positioning right from one side from another side sensors collecting that data also and that's where we should probably uh, you know also think about some new definitions what is private there and what's not in terms of you know these sensors around us that's what i wanted to say and i guess that open data would help us with that uh when we are uh, would also focus on public private partnership with NGOs, of course and, you know involvement thank you very much Uh, thank you very much, Mikhail. Uh, I think uh, we find some ideas for the session to the next year. Not only open source, but open data, and so on, so on. And uh, Andrei, uh, some words from you. To turn to human rights, not only to open source. I'd like to tell uh, a couple of words about uh, prerequisites of uh, the usage of the for example, so source of player uh, in sphere of human rights development. They, they should be, at first, technological development, uh, the second is legal protection on all levels, on the supranational, national, and uh, the community level. They are also rela relations uh, uh, where the free software is involved, should be protected on all levels. Uh, the third prerequisite is uh, the general economic and social development uh, of uh, different states, as it was mentioned by uh, a report of Dr. Hawkshaw, uh, which is very important for developing states, uh, especially. And uh, the, uh, the last prerequisite is uh, development of legal and information culture of users. All these prerequisites um, is needed to uh, make uh, open source software a kind of fi a field for the human rights protection and development. Uh, and, uh, the last words I would like to say is the uh, Internet Governance Forum and the basic multi-stakeholder cooperation of the, of the international uh, internet governance forum, or the global internet governance forum, should be the best field 
of discussion of this kind of issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrei. Uh, many thanks to all the participants. Uh, uh, thank you for your opinion, for your questions. It's uh, very, very important. And uh, this topic is important, uh, I think, uh, for all human beings, and, uh, for uh, information society development, for uh, our future. Our future. Thank you very much.